Hello, welcome to this uh, Phonics Author Workshop with Abigail Steele. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, you will have to be patient with me because this is um, the second time that I've used this Crowdcast platform. Uh, so please excuse me if I'm not brilliant on the technology, but we'll try and get the hang of it. Hopefully you can see that we've got a little chat box and I'm just going to type hello in there. So you're very welcome to talk to me on chat if you have any questions or you just want to say hi. Um, I believe as well that I can add you. So if you wanted to come up on the screen with me to talk and sort of meet each other in person, you can do that as well. And I'm really hoping today um, to be able to talk to you about the process of writing a phonics decodable reader um, for your interest and to sort of develop you that you probably have an interest in doing that, but also I have a motive of commissioning. So I'm going to tell you about myself, tell you about the commissioning process for the specific book series that, that I work with, that I project manage, and I write some of these. So this is the uh, Rising Stars Rocket Phonic books that are used in many, many schools across the world, actually. Um, and I hope that as a result of this workshop, you'll take the opportunity to get in touch with me and perhaps connect, provide a sample um, if it's something that you would like to do. So bear with me and let me see how I can share my screen. Here we are. I made some little slides to guide us through. Minimize that one. Let's present that one. Sorry, guys, I just want to check that you can. Oh, dearie me. Oh, do you know, I had a trial run of this beforehand as well, so it should be working. And there we are. There we are. My apologies. So, I'm assuming now that you can all see the PowerPoint presentation, Phonics Author Workshop with Abigail Steele. So who am I? Who is Abigail Steele? My background is that I was a primary school teacher for a lot of years and gradually I've become a literacy consultant and a phonics specialist. So one part of my job involves me going to schools, training people in phonics and in literacy and advising them sort of to improve their practice. And the other part of my job is me working with publishers. So I advise publishers, I write for them, I manage projects around primary literacy and phonics. And then the other part of my job is specifically as a series editor and an author for this range of books, Rising Stars, Rocket Phonics, and they are decodable reading books. As I mentioned, the reason that I want to hold this session is I want to encourage more people to come forward to try writing decodable readers. Um, every year when I commission new batches, I have this kind of like frantic process of trying to appeal to people to come forward, trying to find talent. And I think that some people don't step forward to write these books because you just don't know the opportunity exists. And it seems to be the same authors, which is great. I love all our traditional authors that we've been using for many years, but I'm always on the lookout for new creative talent, new people that want to give this a go. Another part of me wanting to open up that window is that actually that was me. So uh, when I was a, a sort of teacher trying to branch into this area, I didn't know, you know what to do, where do I turn? And I had to learn on the job, which has turned out absolutely fine, but I want to make it easier for people. So I'm looking for new talent. So I'm going on the assumption that there might be some of you watching this who have no clue what phonics is. You've seen the kind of write books and you're interested in writing books, but phonics, decodable, what does that mean? So very briefly, phonics is the method of teaching people to read and write by allocating, allocating letters and groups of letters of the English alphabet to the sounds of English speech. So with that word phonics at the bottom, we would allocate the sounds f, o, n, i, k, s, phonics. And what is a decodable reading book? So decodable means that everything that is in that book has been previously taught at the phonics code level. So if you want the children to read a book that contains it is an ant, they have to have been taught those pieces of code, those letter, letter sound correspondences, s, a, t, i, p, n. If they've been taught that in class at school or at home if they're homeschooled, then they should be able to blend, to decode, to read 
it is an ant. And this is how we really slowly and gently and gradually move children through the process to, to become readers. So decodable means the children are able to read it pretty much independently because they've already been taught the letters and sounds in that book. And here's just a little few examples of some of those books, just a few covers. And you can see that we have um, a colour progression through these as well. And I'm going to talk through the progression quite closely in this session today so that you can get an idea about what are the technical aspects, you know, how do we approach the technicalities of what that book needs to be like. Um, I hope you can see that these are really aesthetically pleasing. We use a wide variety of illustrators because we like having different styles. But they all have a little bit of a similar feel with the branding, with the illustration style. You can see the, the kind of appeal that we're going for with our books. Sorry, phone ringing. So what skills do you need to have to be able to write these decodable readers? You need to have an understanding of phonics. So it doesn't need to be an in-depth understanding. It can be a really basic understanding because we can support you with that. So you don't need to be a phonics expert. Generally, people who come to writing these do have some experience of teaching with phonics or using phonics, but it can just be that your child learned to read with some phonics or you just you get it, you get the concept of phonics. You don't need to be an expert. And probably more importantly, ironically, you might think phonics is more important, but it's not, the ability to put together a simple story. So just a really simple storyline. Just And we're talking beginning, middle and end. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. And again, this is something that you can come to with no experience because you can learn on the job and you'll get full support. But these are the two strands of what you need to be able to do. Understand what phonics is and the ability to put together a simple story. So understanding of phonics, um, you would be given a brief. So you'd be given a, a document which says to you, right, I would like you please to write a story and I would like it to only have these pieces of code. So only these letter sound correspondences on the top line. So s, a, t, i, p, n, m, d, g, o, k, k, k. So those are the letters and sounds you can have in your book. So you can't write a story that contains it was a hot sunny day because you haven't taught yet. You haven't taught uh in sunny. You haven't taught the E for the Y letter on the end of sunny. You haven't taught A in day. So we can't have that line in the story. You could have Tim sat on a pink mat because all of the letters and sounds used in that sentence are in your brief. They're the things that you're allowed to put into that story. And then thinking about the ability to write a simple story, it literally is as simple as you need to have a beginning. So you introduce the story, the setup, the characters, you know, what it's going to be about. A middle. So something's going to happen in the middle of the story. Um, a problem, a challenge, a new experience and an end. We always look for a satisfying resolution. And sometimes that's the challenge because you might have a great idea for a theme great character, great situation that they're in, they're exploring something, but, but you need to kind of finish it off. But again, we can support you to work on developing these skills. So we're going to explore the different levels and look at what are the technical criteria. And because this is pretty huge, we're only gonna focus on some of it today. And um, also I have another ulterior motive. I am specifically going to be commissioning um, within the next few months for levels pink C, red C, and yellow plus. So we're gonna focus on the lower levels, but I'll also give you a snippet of orange just to show you the scope of where this goes. And I tend to find that people play around and experiment with writing at different levels, and you find your preference or your comfort zone. So it's quite different writing a very beginner reader at pink A than it is from writing a higher level reader at green or orange. There's different skills involved, um, di uh, different aspects that you need to think about and people tend to have a preference of one or the other doesn't mean you can't do both and some authors do do both so our levels go through pink to orange and then the lower levels are broken into slightly smaller chunks to make it um, more gently progressive for readers so this is an example from pink a and when you're given a brief, you're given this document, and, and this is actually screenshot from the document, so it literally describes to you what is allowed to be in that book. 
So down the first column, pin K, and this is the equivalent of Letters and Sounds 2007 Phase 2. So if you're familiar with that guidance document that the UK government had, um, it's archived, but you can still access it off um, the website, the internet, you can download it. But these are the letter sounds that we allow in the pink A book. In the middle column, you've got example words, absolutely not exhaustive. So you may think of more words that you can put in there. And occasionally, because I'm just human, you might come across words in there that are repeated or you might find an error. And by all means, flag that up to me. You know, this is an evolving document. We're always making changes on it. But the, the, the lists of words here are progressive so that they have been built as we add in each new letter sound. And this is some examples of what could be included. And then on the third column, this is really important, and I really hope that you're not um, put off by this actually, but this is a guideline. We try really, really hard to stick to this guideline, the description of features, but we do make allowances. So if we are working on a story, and actually we've gone a couple of words over or it's a couple of words under or we want to use a plural it says here don't use any plurals but we really want to use a plural and it, it's important for that story to make sense we would make an exception for that and we would include it so don't take this as absolutely firm for the description of features there is some flexibility so at pink a the pink a books have 12 pages but because we include an inside sort of front cover and sort of a back cover with some comprehension questions, the actual pages for the story is 10. There are 10 pages in which you can tell your story. The total word count for that book needs to sit between 25 and 35. If it's way outside of that, we wouldn't be able to, to do it. We'd have to make cuts or add some to it. So 25 to 35 words. Words per verso. So verso and recto are the technical publishing terms used to refer to the left hand page or the right hand page. And even to this day, I have to double check myself and go, oh, verso, is that on the left hand side or the right hand side? It's on the left. So when you open the spread and you're looking at two pages in front of you, it's the page on the left that we position one sentence per, per verso, per left hand page for pink A books. We only use CVC words. Now, CVC means consonant, vowel, consonant, but we're not referring to consonant, vowel, consonant, letters. We're referring to sounds. So it doesn't apply in pink A, but when we get later on in the phonics and we start to have digraphs or graphemes with two letters representing one sound, an example might be, imagine the word boat. In the word boat, you have b, Oat. And the O sound is a vowel sound, but it is comprised of two letters, an O and an A. That counts as CVC. No plurals. We have one single sentence that sits on one single line. And this is all to do with kind of children's reading development and the tracking of the eye and the cognitive load. It's all very sort of well thought out. We do use full sentences. Now, if you write for different publishers and different schemes, you might be asked to write fragments of sentences or phrases or captions. And we try really hard in Rocket Phonics to have proper sentences with a capital letter, a verb, and a full stop. Occasionally, we will make an exception if it's important to be able to tell the story. We do allow exclamations. We keep it really simple. We try to align it with natural speech patterns in the language. Uh, we try to make the stories really creative and humorous. Children find things very funny at this age, so we go for humor a lot. We try to relate the stories to children's own experiences. So we're thinking about what have they experienced, what can they relate to? Things like um, the first day at school, or the family welcomes a new sibling, or the family gets a new pet, or going to the dentist, or bumping your knee. We try to include at least one high frequency word. So at the bottom, you'll see the little list of high frequency words. And really, these are actually common exception words. They are words which are used at high frequency. We use them a lot, but the children haven't yet got the phonics code to access all of that word purely through decoding. So some of that word they can decode. Some of it they can apply some phonics, like they'll know t because they've been taught t to this point but they know ah, oh, they don't know ooh as in two or o oh, as in go. So these are common exception, high frequency words that we include at this level. 
and we try to have some repetition of keywords, but we avoid repeated phrasing. So historically, you might have a book um, that said, uh, I don't, it is a mat, I sit on the mat, Tim is on the mat, Dan is on the mat. And actually that is so repetitive that really the children just learn very quickly that it's just on the mat. And we try to bring in a lot more variety to the stories. So that's level pink A. And this is a real example, a book called Mop It. And this is the actual text taken from the book. And this all fits that criteria you've just seen. So Mop It, the tap is on, so there's a leak coming through the ceiling. And this little girl, Kim, has spotted this leak. Kim got a pot and a pan. Dad got a cap and a mop. So dad's put a cap on to protect himself from the drips. He's grabbed a mop to try and mop up the water. Mog, who is the cat, Mog can dip in it and sip it. There's a funny page where Mog is just enjoying the water coming through the ceiling. And then at the end, it's Pop can nap in it. So the grandpa is asleep in the chair whilst the water drips on his head, completely oblivious. And in the artwork for that final page, to kind of give that resolution to the story, it's a split artwork. So you can see the grandpa asleep in the chair downstairs, but you can see a cross section, you can see upstairs, and you can see mum is actually turning the taps off on the bath. So the artwork then explains, oh, that's why there was a leak coming down. The tap was running and the water leaked over the side of the bath and it caused the leak. So it's a satisfying story for children. Pink B. So now we've got our next batch of letter sounds that we use in these stories. We can also use anything from the previous level. So any of the letter sounds, any of the word examples from pink A can also be carried forward into pink B. But because we're focusing on pink B, we really want the story to sort of pick upon and focus upon things that are pertinent to pink B. So at pink B, you'll have stories about socks and kicks and eggs and pups and hens. You'll see a bit of a pattern because of some of the words that you can get at that level. We've got the same high frequency common exception words at Pink B. The story is still 10 pages long. The word count has increased. It's actually doubled because now we have a sentence per page. So previously just one sentence on the verso, so it's per spread and now it's per page. So we're increasing that level of text for children. We're still focusing on CBC words, but now we allow plurals. We still want the single sentence to sit on one line. We don't want children to eye to have to track over to the next level. We allow full stops, exclamations and commas. Environmental text can be included. So environmental text is when you have in the artwork a label or a sign or um, imagine in the story, the little boy called Nick has picked up somebody's sack, it's a bag, it's a sack, and on the sack is a label and it says um, pegs, it's a peg bag, so it says pegs on the label. So environmental text means it's not in the sentence of the, of the story, it's in the artwork. We do want the text still to be really simple and quite predictable. Um, some, sometimes it's actually really hard to keep it simple enough because we get so creative with our ideas and, and we know that little children could be so switched on and so bright that we want to extend them. But it's important for the progression of the reading and the reading skills to keep it quite simple. And we still try to relate those stories to familiar objects, familiar actions and experiences for children. So here's the example from Pink B. This is a story called The Mess. Now on the screen, I've shown um, two sentences side by side and in the actual book, these are on um, either side of the spread. So on the first page, you've got Rick is in a mess and his bedroom's really, really messy. And on the second page, you've got mum is a bit cross and you've got mum standing there looking a bit stern. And we try to get the artworks just right so that mum looks a bit cross, a bit annoyed, but that she's not angry with him. You know, you have to be really careful with the messages that you're giving to children. And part of you writing these decodable readers is that you would create your text, but you also brief the artwork. So you would actually describe what you want that picture to look like in as much detail as you possibly can. So in the description for Mum is a bit cross, when we were writing that story, I'd have put, um, please have Mum standing in the doorway of the bedroom with her hands on her hips. She's wearing blue jeans, sneakers, she has a green jumper on. Um, she's wearing a necklace. She's wearing earrings. Mum has a face which looks stern and a bit annoyed, but not angry. And we, you know, please focus on the facial expression. Um, and then we would describe anything else in the background of that picture. So 
the more detailed you can be in describing your vision of that artwork, actually that is really, really helpful for the artist. So Rick is in a mess, mum is a bit cross. Pick it up, Rick. So you can imagine she's saying, come on, Rick, you know, pick it up. But it is not fun, mum. And the artwork will show Rick looking a bit like, oh, mum, I don't want to pick up this mess. And she's saying, I am the boss. So then we have this funny situation. Rick hid the Ted in the bed. And you can imagine how humorous that picture is that he's putting the Teddy under the bed covers to hide him. Rick put the rat in the hat. So he's hiding his toy rat under a cap. Rick put the rug on the mug, so he's tucking the rug, uh, the mug underneath the, the mug. Oh, goodness me. Uh, mum comes back and he says, oh, look, mum, it's been really fun to pick up the mess. And she's looking a bit exasperated because there is still clearly a mess and he's just hidden it. And he's had great fun doing that. Now, something else I want to point out to you in this story, which is a really useful tip, is this idea of repetition of three. So there are three examples in this story of Rick repeating an action. So the first one is he hides the teddy. The second one is he hides the rat. And the third one is he hides that mug underneath the rug. And that's quite a classic feature of decodable readers and story texts for young children. That, that in the story, there's this repetition of the action happens three times. And sometimes in the story, the first two times are the unsuccessful attempt to solve a problem. So tried to solve the problem, didn't work. Tried to solve the problem, didn't work. And then the third time is tried to solve the problem and it worked. And there's your successful resolution to the problem. And then you can use your final part of the story to kind of wrap up and, and sum up and have a happy ending. So the repetition, the rule of three is a useful tip for story writing. Pink C. So this is a level that I am looking to commission imminently. So if you're looking to submit something um, this time round, please sort of think about this and pay attention to this. So in Pink C, Pink A and Pink B were really relevant because they've set the scene for you in the kind of general level of the story that we're aiming for. And you can repeat and reuse everything that you've seen in the previous charts. But in Pink C, we specifically want to help children practice this new word structure. So this is where children are using a low level of letter sounds, but we're putting it together into kind of two syllable words or words with this C, V, C, V, C. And the great examples here, ticket, pocket, sunset, rocket, carrot, bucket, beckon, laptop, and so on. Um, and by all means, if you can think of any more words to fit in there, then let me know. It's something that I need to do is continue to add to this list to give people ideas of what they can write about. We've still got the 10 pages for the story because we're still at pink level, it's a short story. Our word count is a little bit more flexible, 50 to 80, we're slight progression stepping it up. And we're looking for five to eight words per page, so per sentence, still a single sentence to tell the story. Now we've got these new structures um, and it's the same, the same description of features, full stops, exclamation, comma, environmental text, simple predictable text, stories relating to familiar objects and actions. And I was thinking, did I put an example? Yes, so I put an example for you. So this example is all about tennis. And again, I've shown uh, two pages of text along one line to fit it on the screen for you, but the, the each sentence is set on a separate page. And this is kind of, um, it's almost like a hybrid. So it's not a non-fiction, but it's not a third person narrative. It's a first person kind of hybrid with actually telling children about the experience of going for a tennis lesson. And so it's written in the first person as the character. So the little girl um, with the pigtails with the pink sort of bobbles in, and you can see she's feeling a bit worried about the tennis lesson on the front cover. And it's her experience of going to tennis with a friend called Kat. Um, and Kat loves tennis, Kat already has, she has her backpack, she has her kit, she has a red racket, but the other little girl doesn't have a tennis racket, so she gets to given a tennis racket by the leisure centre. They have a tennis lesson, and Kat's really into it, and she runs to hit the tennis ball, but actually it goes into the net, and Kat is red, she's actually really cross that she hit the ball into the net, but the other little girl has just had such a wonderful time at this tennis lesson, it's kind of very satisfying and interesting story. And we've picked out, so we haven't got loads of those words with a longer structure, we've got a selection, um, going for about one per page, or one every other page, we've got tennis, backpack, racket, lesson, 
tennis, backpack, racket, lesson. So there are four of those longer structure words, but they're repeated a few times and they're mixed in with lots of simpler words that they've had previously. So again, it's this gentle progression. So we've not gone crazy trying to pack loads of different words in. There's some repetition, but also keeping it interesting. So pink C is one that I'm focusing on at the moment. Moving on to red A, and I'm not gonna talk through all the levels today. I'm just gonna talk through um, some of the lower ones and then show you orange, and then we'll talk about tips for structure. But red A, so red A is the equivalent of letters and sounds phase three, if you're familiar with that document. There's some examples at the top here of Words that can be formed at this new structure, because we're another new structure now, we're allowing consonant clusters or consonant blends. So when you have two consonants together, um, things like the nd in sand. So the words in grey are comprised of letter sounds from pink. So we've already learned all those letter sounds, but we wouldn't have used those words because we didn't go to that structure. We kept it at kind of the CVC structure. But now that we're accessing the structure, we've got all those new words that we can use, and we've got the new letter sound correspondences, j, v, w, x, y, z, z, q, that we can focus on, and some new words for those there as well. We're still 10 pages. The word count has increased again a little bit more. We've increased the amount of words you can have on the page a little bit. We're now welcoming and practicing different structures. We now welcome speech bubbles. So previously, we wouldn't have had speech bubbles. In the story, The Mess, when Mum was talking to Rick about picking up the mess, even though Mum was speaking, we set it just as the sentence text. We wouldn't put in a speech bubble. Now we start to introduce speech bubbles. So you can think about um, whether a character might be saying something. Um, an example is we have a story about uh, a fox, and he's chasing after some muffins. He's sniffing down these muffins at a picnic. And the fox might have a speech probably saying, yum, muffins. Uh, environmental text, so signs and labels, slightly longer, keeping the sentence as short and clear. So it's a real balance between moving it on, but keeping it short and clear. Following children's natural speech patterns. So when we read the sentences and we think about what children are going to read, we have to think, does that flow naturally for correct speech and the way that children speak at about four to five years of age, because four to five years of age, sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, we start off, the, the intention for these books is that they start at age about four in the reception year or P1, and that we, we progress them to, through to about six to seven years old. Um, still simple story development, one to two sentences per page with no return sweep. So return sweep means when a sentence is broken, a sentence starts on one line and then the sentence goes down to the next line and it's still the same sentence and we don't want that. We can have two sentences, but we would put a full stop at the end of the line and then on the next line down, we would have the next whole sentence. Um, and we can have glossary terms. So if we're doing a non-fiction, you can have little labels within the, within the photographs or artworks to label them. So a little bit of glossary terms. Red B, next batch of letter sounds. So now we've got some digraphs. We've got ch, sh, th, th. That can be two sounds. It can be th and th. Ng, a, e, i, o, u, and u. And we've got some different high frequency words. Um, these high frequency words would have been in red A as well, actually. It's the step up into red for these. Still 10 pages, slightly increased word count slightly increased words per page. We can now have ES plurals, uh, full punctuation marks. So actually we would now include speech marks. So if we were describing some speech in the story, we'd inclu include that. Pre-queuing. So pre-queuing is when you say um, Tom said or Tom yelled, you know, and then the speech in speech marks. Uh, speech bubbles would include, again, just the same, same features, just slightly progressive. And non-fiction, we would have labels and we might have like captions if we're having non-fiction book with photographs. Red C. So Red C is another one that I'm currently focusing on. Um, so Red A and Red B are very relevant in showing you the build-up because in Red C, the criteria is it's the same as Red A and Red B, 
but it's going to focus in on a smaller selection of those letter sound correspondences. So you can use any, you can use any of the letter sounds from red A and red B, but actually we want to feel in that story a stronger focus on a more limited word bank. So there's more repeated practice. So if I was looking at um, number one here and I've got qu, ch, sh, and th, I'm going to really focus my story on those words. So words like um, a queen and maybe she did a quiz, maybe she had some chips or some lunch or there was a shop or a ship um, or she had to shut the door um, and th maybe um, including words like that or then. I would really make sure that there's a lot of that, a strong presence in the story rather than having sort of such a broad range. But other than that, the description of features is exactly the same as it would be for red A and red B. Exploring the levels for yellow. So yellow level, uh, next batch of letter sounds, we're coming up to the end of phase three here for letters and sounds. We're still including those phase four structures. It gets quite exciting now because we open up a lot more language, a lot more vocabulary. So there's a lot more opportunity for the topics and the themes that your stories and your nonfiction can include. We've now got a step up in the quantity of pages in the book. So we have 14 pages in which that you can tell the story. The total word count has jumped up, the words per page has jumped up. Uh, we would, it would be more appropriate to have more variation of sentence structure, so you can get more creative. Your story theme can get more creative. We're moving away from now, it being stories that the children are really familiar with, so things relevant to their sort of home life and their school experience, and you can have fantastical things, so stories about um, monsters, so long as they're not too scary, but dragons and exciting things that happen. Uh, you might have a storyline that follows more of kind of an, an, an episode kind of feature, so a time sequence. So your story might now follow, um, the story starts in the morning, something happens in the afternoon, then there's overnight, then it's the next day. So you can sort of follow a sort of longer span of time. We develop the characters, we invest in the characters a bit more. There's more to talk about for the reader. So it's a bit of a step up into yellow. We might be more creative about where we put the print on the page rather than trying to keep it as simple as possible. Non-fiction texts are still relevant to children's experience and their language patterns. Um, full punctuation marks and we would include a, a, a wider variety of endings now to kind of broaden that for children. Now yellow only has yellow as a one whole level and then yellow plus. So yellow plus is the same as red C in that it focuses in on a smaller range of sounds. You can still use all of them up until this point because it's cumulative, but you're going to be really focusing on a particular group. And these are example groups. So I've batched together four letter sounds as an example, but actually when you look back at the word list, when you look back at here, you might want to put together four different groups of words and use that as your focus for your story. And in yellow, we've got the next level of common exception words. The description of features is exactly the same with a slight increase on the amount of words that you can include for that progression. So that is yellow and yellow is another one that I'm particularly focusing on at the moment, looking for submissions. Because it would take absolutely forever to go through all those with you, and actually, when it comes to the point of briefing and commissioning, you would get a document with all of these levels on, and you now understand how this document works and what these levels are. I'm just jumping straight down to orange to show you that the higher end, because some people prefer to write at the higher end. Some people might be more into the creative and the story, and they don't prefer the technicals of the phonics at that very low level. So at orange, you can see that the focus is on much higher levels of words, um, a much higher level of phonics, sort of lots of spelling and pronunciation alternatives. And the orange uh, description, the orange kind of banding runs on two slides, because I couldn't even fit it in on one slide. So it's this slide and the next slide. But you've got all these fabulous, fabulous words to, to use and choose from. The jump up, so at the top end of our books, we have 18 pages for the story. And that gives a total word count of between 450 and 550. So that's where your story needs to end up. 25 to 30 words per page. And really, it's just the big step. You know, we're much more creative with the language. We can use literary language. 
lots of, you know, once upon a time, we can use figurative language to describe things. The sentences are, are more complex, but the meaning still needs to be fairly straightforward because remember these children are only five, six, seven years old. The illustrations are supporting the story. So the illustration, you, you can tell the story through the illustration, but the text kind of leads. And readers should be able to infer meanings from the text. You don't need to be as literal. You can have a little bit of um, inference and nuance, and, and children are really good at that. We'll be flexible about placement of text and images on the page. If we're doing nonfiction, we'd have simple nonfiction, different types of texts um, containing more formal sentences and a wider range of unfamiliar terms. An example of orange is we have a story about, uh, well, it's a, it's a hybrid. A hybrid because it's not non-fiction and that it's um, got purely photographs and is written very impersonally. It's a hybrid because it's a recount, but it's all about describing an experience of a trip to the opticians. So it's told in first person, it's illustrated with a little bit of photographing, and it's all about a little boy's experience. I went to the optician and all of the things that the optician did and the things they talked about to, to make children feel interested and comfortable with experiences like going to the optician. Um, readers may use the contents page to find answers to questions. So if you're doing a non-fiction, we would include a contents page at Orange. Full punctuation speech, and we would try to vary those verbs for speech. So we're going to try and kind of push the boat out a little bit on what we use. And this just finishes off that banding criteria. We would include italics, and we would include things like bold, so some different features there. So that was a rambling whistle stop tour of some of the levels. And I've got an example of orange here. This is an example of a lovely story um, called The Knitting Giant. And something that you can do at any level is you can have your own idea for a story or for a nonfiction, but you can also go for a retelling. So you might have a story in your mind, um, uh, something as simple as uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and you can give it your own flavor. So you might do a quite straightforward retelling, or you might give it a reversal. You might do it as, um, I don't know, flipping the sort of gender reversal, making uh, the hero the princess and not always the hero the prince in a, in a fairy tale. But you can use stories that already exist, myths, legends, um, fables, traditional stories, well-loved stories, that have no copyright because they were written you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And you can, you can do your own version. Sometimes that's a nice starting point. So this story has a feel of a traditional story because we've got that language. Once upon a time, there lived a gentle giant called Gina who loved to knit. Each night she would fetch her rucksack of wool and huge needles and start to knit. And you can tell just from that that the phonics focus in this book is soft G, so gentle giant Gina. You've got soft C in once, um, and you've got the N spelled with K-N as in knit and knitting. So the starting point, what is it that we need to do? Be thinking of an idea, have a notepad, always be jotting down ideas all the time, anything that springs to mind. Sometimes I sit down and have a huge brainstorm. I go, right, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to blurb out on the paper any ideas I can think about. You need to get an idea and then you need to write a little sample. So you're going to have a little play around with what the structure might be or what a sentence, a couple of sentences might be or a page might be. So you're going to just start getting some ideas onto paper. When you're brainstorming ideas, some people like to go and do research by looking at what exists online already. Personally, I never, ever do this. If I go and look at what exists online, what do different schemes have, what other ideas do people have, I get really depressed because actually there's hundreds of these books already written. So it makes me think like, oh gosh, they've already had all the good ideas. I can't come up with any new ideas. That makes me feel a bit down. Um, and then also I find that with the best will in the world, if I go and look at other people's ideas, even though I then try and think of my own ideas, they're in my subconscious, they're in my brain, I end up with coming out with ideas that are too similar to other people's. And we want to try and get something as unique and individual as possible, something we're always looking for new, new ideas or a new twist or a new take. So I don't do that research first. First, I look at the banding guidelines. So I look at those word banks and I see what words jump out at me and see if I can get some ideas from that. 
then I start to think about a plot with a problem and resolution. And sometimes I have tons of those ideas of plots of, oh, this could happen or that can happen. And loads of them are absolutely rubbish. But it's the process that I need to go to to find the good idea is to have all of these not very good ideas. So if I was going to write a book at yellow, or I might be thinking about yellow plus, and I might be focusing on these banks of words, I'm going to have a look at these words, and I'm just going to sit with them. And I might sit with them for quite a long time. And I might sit with them, do some ideas and come back to it later or come back to it another day, because it sits in your brain when you're not even realising it, you'll end up dreaming about these words. So I'm thinking, right, car. Oh, great. Kids love stories about cars. That's really child friendly. So, oh, look, I've got some names there. Mark and Carl. Carl and car are a bit similar. It's a bit tongue twisty. Maybe Mark, um, Mark's dad is getting a new car or Mark's dad, his car broke down on the way to work. And then there's our drama. There's our problem. Or Mark's dad's talking about getting a new car and Mark really, really wants dad to get a red car. But Mark's dad is not going to get a red car. So there's our problem. Because you've got to remember the problems are problems in the children's eyes. So the colour of a car might well be a problem for Mark. Or, and literally I'm doing this as I talk to you, Mark's in the play area at school and he wants to play with that toy red car, but somebody else has got it and he's really cross about that and he wants to have a turn. And then we've got a story forming about the idea of sharing and taking turns and that he loves this car because children do get really obsessive about toys. So there's an idea. Card. Card, why might we have a card? Somebody makes a card. Somebody's not very well, somebody makes a card for somebody else to get well soon. Um, stark, that's a bit of an obscure word, not sure that might fit in. Park, they go to the park, some kids go to the park. Art, children love doing art, they do some art. So I go through and I start to get things in my head and often it's what draws me in. So shark, shark is really interesting, really exciting. I want to do loads of things with sharks. Shark might be my way into this. So I sit with these words and on a piece of paper, I literally start to put them together. What we don't want, what, what doesn't really work is to pack too many of these in to every sentence. So I wouldn't have, Mark went in the car to the park and he went through the arch into the garden. Like it, That's too much. We don't need to have them crammed in. It can be natural and have them spread through the story. Sometimes you need to go through a process of you put too many in and we end up you know, taking them out and that's absolutely fine. There are things to think about, things to have in your mind when you're thinking about what kind of idea or story or non-fiction topic you might be you know, formulating a plan for. Age appropriacy. I am absolutely guilty. I always pitch things too high. So I'm terrible for, I don't patronise children. I speak to them in quite a grown-up way. I don't use a babyish voice. I think children are so intelligent, such incredible creatures that I always aim really high. And actually, I often have to bring myself back down to remember to keep it simpler, keep the storyline simpler, and, and try and see things through children's eyes, that the things that I think might be interesting or funny or a problem and a resolution that's not what they necessarily think is funny or a problem or a resolution. So age appropriacy. Cultural representation and authenticity. I'm always absolutely striving to, to get a really wide range of cultural representation. I want all children, no matter where they are in the world, whatever their background, whatever their cultural context, that there are books that they see themselves in. But it's got to be authentic. It can't just be oh, I'm going to put um, children of different skin colour. So they all feel like they've got the skin colour. It's got to be really authentic about the types of geographical area, the nature of cultures. And often what we do to support people with that is we seek out experts. So we will actually refer our stories to experts and reviewers to help us get that right. Cultural and religious sensitivity. So you have to remember that actually for some of us, so for me, I have a pet dog, but some of the people who might be reading these books um, in other countries or in England, um, but of particular religions, in those religions, it's offensive to have a dog inside. A dog is an outdoor animal. Um, so we wouldn't have dogs inside. We are respectful of what food people might eat. So in some religions and cultures, people don't eat particular foods, and therefore it would be really insensitive of us to include that in, in a story. Um, definitely nothing of the supernatural. That has huge um, cultural and religious 
issues. So although we might think that children absolutely love a story about ghosts or witches, we just wouldn't do it because of the purpose of these books being educational and used in schools across the world. Uh, we're very kind of strict on that. International appropriacy. So that kind of sums up what I've just said about taking account of different cultures, religions, different countries, trying to be representative, but authentically trying to be sensitive. Um, and we all make mistakes. So don't worry if you had an idea or you put something forward and it had something that wasn't very appropriate. I would just come back to you and say, oh, I don't think you realise this particular thing wasn't appropriate. But when we send out briefing materials, we actually send out a document with quite a long list of do's and don'ts so that you have a bit of a heads up. And of course, no discrimination and no stereotyping. We work really, really hard to make sure that we don't have any discrimination of any type um, and no stereotyping of any type. So starting point, once you've had your brainstorm and you've got some words, you sort of, you've decided what level you want to have a go at, you've got your words, you've got a bit of an idea for a story, you do then need to go and check your idea to make sure it hasn't been done before. So to do that, you would go to publishers' websites or the publishers' website. So I'm thinking of, of our particular publisher, which is the Rising Stars website, and I have a link in a minute on the slide. But you go to the website and you look at the list of titles or the brochure of titles already available. I don't do this across different publishers' websites because if I don't look at a different publisher's website and a similar story already exists, it doesn't really matter because it was genuine that I didn't see that story. I didn't take that story from there or that idea. It was genuinely my idea because I never looked. And I'm more concerned about, I don't want repetition in our strand of books. So in our list of books, we don't want two stories the same. We want to try and have them different. So I wouldn't worry too much about the wider research, focusing on the publisher that you're aiming to write for. And equally, if um, you wanted to go and write these books for other publishers, do your research and go and look at their list and try and come up with things that are different for them for their list. So you'd look at the list and there's, there's brochures that you can download. And you can see all the titles already available. Now from a title, because you'll only be able to see the titles, it might be that the title is quite similar to your idea, but because you don't know the content of that story, you can still put it forward and you can say to me, look, I know it's a bit similar, but can you find out if it's too similar? Because sometimes what's in the story might not be the same storyline or it's different enough that we can still work with it. But it's worthwhile because otherwise I'm going to come back to you if you submit things and I'm going to say, sorry, we already have a retelling of Three Little Pigs, Goldilocks, Red Riding Hood. We already have all those. Um, do you have any different ones? Or I might say to you, thanks for your ideas. We already have these. What we don't have is, and I might then give you an idea and say, we don't have um, uh, Three Billy Goats Gruff. Actually, so could you have a go at working on that one for us? Because we have a gap there. So that it works in both ways, but it's helpful if you come with your ideas that, that aren't the same. And this is an example of an online brochure. So on the Rocket Phonics section of the Rising Stars website, there is a downloadable PDF. So you can have a copy of this and you can look through. So you can see here why I'm looking at commissioning some more for Yellow Plus, because we actually only have three books in this strand. And I would like, uh, sorry, six books. We have six books in the Yellow Plus strand. And I would like to double that. I would like there to be 12. So it matches the amount of books that we have in the Yellow Pack. So you can have a look there and you can see all of the things already at yellow and you can scroll through, through and see all of the different levels as well. OK, once you've got your idea, you might want to submit it before you work too much on it, because what I wouldn't want is that you spend hours slaving away, making these really great stories or, you know, planning it all out, doing loads of work. And then you submit and you come to me. And I have to say, oh, my gosh, you've spent hours on that, but we're not going to be able to use it because we already have one like that or because it's just not quite appropriate. There's you know, some storyline that's not appropriate for our scheme. So you need to submit an idea. So you would email me and you would say, dear Abby, I've got this idea. It's about a boy called Mark who is who is goes. That was me rushing my slides, wasn't it? Who goes to the park with his dad and brother. The boys are competitive and Mark always loses in races and climbing, but in the end, he helps his brother out. So there's our resolution. Here are some of the focus words I would use in this story. Mark, park, Carl, bark and start. That can be your submission to me. That could be our starting point for our conversation. And I can say to you, brilliant, you're onto a winner. I'd like you to develop it. Here's the guidelines. Um, can you go to the next step? 
Or I'd come back to you and say, love your idea, but actually it's not going to be right for us. Maybe look at another publisher if you want to put it forward to them. But for us, I might give you some ideas then, or I might say, can you go back to the drawing board and have another think? When it comes to developing your storyline further, so this might be because you've submitted an idea and I've said, yes, please, or it might be because actually you want to practice. So you want to practice writing these books. Um, so you're going to have a go at sort of mapping out the whole story. You need to think about, well, how many pages are there at my chosen level? So on my banding guideline document for yellow, I think it's 14 pages for the story. So I've got 14 pages. And then you're going to split the story across that amount of sections. So kind of mapped out. And this isn't how everybody works. This is how I work. This is how I've written stories and how I support and advise people to do it. But if you have another way, by all means, do it your way. Um, I'm just trying to be supportive to show you my process. So actually, I've accidentally put 16 sections here, but I think yellow is 14 sections. So I'd have to get rid of a couple of boxes. And I've thought about, first I thought about box one, my introduction. So in the, in the beginning, I want to introduce Mark. So it's going to be, this is Mark, introduction to my main character. Then I'm going to introduce Mark's brother, Carl. Then I'm going to introduce the beginning of the storyline. Mark and Carl are very competitive. The dad takes them to the park. So this is the story moving, the progression in time. At the park, they start doing things that are competitive. They start having contests. So I can climb the highest or I can run the highest. And I would build in that um, repetition of three. So there would be three things that happen. The first two things are going to be competitions where Carl, the brother, wins and Mark is really sad. Mark loses. And the third thing that happens or the third competition is going to be in box 11. Carl gets stuck. Carl and dad have no solution for that. But Mark has an idea to help. And then by the end, I'm saying Mark is happy because he saved the day. And I've got missing sections because when I plan this out, I might need to rejig it. I might go, oh, I've taken up far too many boxes, which is pages, planning the beginning of the story. This is slow. This story is too slow. I need to start with a bit more action. Or I might be kind of getting to the finish of my story and I'm only at page 10 and going, oh, I've got like four to six more pages to fill. So I need to rejig the structure so it maps out across the right amount of pages in this book. So although you need to be creative and have this story, you've also got to be quite sort of technical and mathematic to kind of plot it out across the boxes. You need to be prepared to work collaboratively. So being open minded about feedback and we're always super, super supportive and super positive. But I'm always really, really upfront with people that if you were to send me a manuscript, a story that you've written and you say, I've written this story, I'm really proud of it. I'm really excited about it. You know, do you think it's ready for submission? Do you think you could put this forward for the scheme? I might come, it's, it's highly likely I would come back to you and say, this is a good idea. You are on the right track, but we need to work together to get it exactly right for the technical aspects. We can't have these words. We need to replace them. We can't have this sentence. There's too many words in it. We can't have this resolution. It, it isn't satisfying enough. So there is a development process where we work together to make changes to your work. And if you are too precious about your work, um, you will get frustrated because we have to work together to get it to fit the brief and there's kind of no maneuverability on that. But that said, you can have as much or as little support as you need from your team. And when I say your team, I mean me as your series editor. And then we have a team of um, development editors, copy editors. We have the publisher. We have reviewers. There's quite a big team kind of backing you behind you that support you to get your story the way that we need it to be for the brief, but also the way that you want it to be so that you're really happy with it and you're proud of it and you're satisfied with it. So there's as much or as little support as you need. So to finish off, before I come back sort of with my face, see if there's any questions in the chat or if you want to ask anything, some useful references. So this is the uh, web address for Rocket Phonics on the Rising Stars platform. Rising Stars are the publisher. Rocket Phonics is this particular series of books. So it's really worth going there and having a look at the Rocket Phonics and getting a feel for it. The next one down, Abigail Still Training. This is my website. It's a place that you can access um, this session that you're in today, future sessions. You can, there's a contact section. You can get in touch with me. There's other sorts of training. And then my email address, importantly. So my email address, abbysteel.com 
educationconsultant at gmail.com. And I really hope that you feel welcome to get in touch with me, email me, send me your CV. Your CV doesn't need to be all singing and dancing. I'm not looking for previous experience. I purely need your CV to know, well, who are you? Let's get to know each other. You know, generally, what's your interest? And then moving forward, I would need that CV to have your details. It would be, you know, your name, your address, um, sort of get you on the system, on the database of, of authors and your samples and your ideas. Um, so I really hope that as a next step, you'll feel kind of confident to go away and have a think about this and then get in touch with me. So let's stop sharing and come back. Here we are. Right, is there anybody with any questions that you want to type into the chat? Um, or, I'm not sure quite how it works, but I think you can kind of request that I bring you up on screen um, and then we can sort of chat face to face. But if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. I really hope that you found it interesting and useful. I'm absolutely hoping on a wish and a prayer that the slides actually did share with you and that I haven't just done an entire session of me talking and not showing you any slides. If in the event of that happening, um, I will find your email address through your sign up and I will make sure I send out to you these slides so that you can actually go, you know, see them and put them in context. Um, and if it completely failed, then I will offer you another session that you can come on and meet me perhaps on a Zoom. Uh, but I really wanted to use Crowdcast because it is the platform that I would like to use moving forward to do training sessions. It's, it is a really good one. I've just got to get the hang of using it. So thank you so much for coming along. I've got no questions in the chat. I hope you found it really interesting, not too overwhelming. I really hope you will get in touch with me and that we can connect. And also give me some feedback as to whether you felt there was anything missing from this session or anything that you would need as your next steps, anything I can do to support you and work with you. And that's it for now. So thanks, everybody. Have a really fabulous day. See you soon.